Chapter 19 of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. 19. The Daredevil Barber. To roll over Niagara Falls in a barrel is an odd way of courting death but it seems that death must be courted somehow. Danger is more attractive to many men than drink. They prefer gambling with their lives to gambling with their money. They have the gambler's faith in their lucky star. They are preoccupied with the vision of victory to the exclusion of all timid thoughts. They have a dramatic sense that sets them anticipatorily on a stage, bowing to the applause of the multitude. It is the applause, I fancy, rather than the peril itself, that entices them. The average boy who performs a deed of daring do performs it before his admiring fellows. Even in so small a thing as ringing a bell and running away, he likes to have spectators. Few boys ring bells out of mischief when they are alone. Poor Mr. Charles Stevens, the daredevil barber of Bristol, who lost his life at Niagara Falls in his six-foot barrel the other Sunday, made sure that there would be plenty of witnesses of his adventure. Not only had he a party of sightseers in motors along the road following the cask on its perilous voyage, but he had a cinematograph photographer ready to immortalize the affair on a film. Two other persons, it is said, had already accomplished a similar feat. One of them, a woman, was just about gone, according to a witness, when we got her out of the barrel. The other was a used-up man for several weeks. This, however, did not deter the daredevil barber. Had he not already on one occasion put his head into a lion's mouth? Had he not boxed in a lion's den? Had he not stood up to men with rifles who shot lumps of sugar from his head? It may seem an extraordinary way to behave in a world in which there are so many reasonable opportunities for heroism, but men are extraordinary creatures. There is no adventure so wild that they will not embark on it. There are men who, if they took it into their heads that there was one chance in a hundred of reaching the moon by being precipitated into space in some kind of torpedo, would volunteer for the adventure. They do these mad things alike for trivial and noble ends. They love a stunt even, or especially, at the risk of their lives. Half the airplane accidents are due to the fact that many men prefer risk to safety. To do some things that other people cannot do seems to them the only way of justifying their existence. It is an initiation into aristocracy. Every man is the rival of all other men, and he is not satisfied till he has beaten them. If he is a great cricketer, or a great poet, or a cabinet minister, or wins the derby, his ambition as a rule is fulfilled, and he does not feel the need of jumping down Etna or hanging by his toes from the Eiffel Tower in order to create a sensation. But if a man is no use at either poetry or football, he must do something. Blondin became a world-famous figure simply by walking along a tightrope along which neither Shakespeare nor Shelley could have walked. It may be that they would have had no desire to walk along it, but, in any case, Blondin was able to feel that he could beat the greatest of men in at least one game. In his own business, he stood above the Apostle Paul and Michelangelo and Napoleon. He was a king, and, even if you did not envy him his trade, you had to envy him his throne. He was a man you would have liked to meet at dinner, not for the sake of his conversation, but for the sake of his uniqueness. One remembers how one stood with heart and mouth as he set out with his balancing pole in his hand on his journey across the rope, blindfolded, and pretending to stumble every ten yards. A single false step, and he would have fallen from the height of a tower to certain death, for there was no net to catch him. Strange that one should have cared whether he fell or not, but ninety-nine out of a hundred did care. We watched him as breathlessly as though he were carrying the future of the world in his hands. He knew that he was interesting us, engrossing us, and that was his reward. It was a reward, no doubt, that could be measured in gold, but it is more than greed of gold that sets men courting death in such ways. The joy of being unique is at least as great as the joy of being rich, 
and the surest way of becoming unique is to trail one's coat in the presence of death and challenge him to tread on the tail of it not that even the most daring seeker after uniqueness fails to take numerous precautions for his safety no man is mad enough to set out along a tightrope in hobnail boots without previous practice no woman who has not learned to swim has ever tried to swim the english channel from dover to cape grinez even the daredevil barber of bristol insured himself so far as he could against the perils of his adventure he had an oxygen tank in the barrel which would have kept him alive for a time if the barrel had not been swept under the falls and he had friends patrolling the waters to recover the barrel like the schoolboy who takes risks he did not feel that he was going to get caught i have the greatest confidence he said that i shall come through all right his previous escapes must have given him the assurance that he was not born to die of danger not only had he served through the war but he had once plucked a woman from the railway line when the express was so near that it tore her skirt he must have felt that one man at least could live in perfect safety in the kingdom of danger he was probably less nervous as he crept into his barrel than a schoolgirl would be in getting into a boat on the chute he had we may be sure his thrill but was it the thrill of being in peril or the thrill of being conspicuous some men of course there are who love danger for danger's sake and who would run risks in an empty world men of this kind make good spies and in their youth good burglars theirs is the desire of the moth for the star or at any rate of the moth that feels it is different from every other moth and can successfully dare the candle flame to play with fire and not be consumed is a universal pleasure the child passes its fingers through the gas flame and glories in the sensation it is like playing a game of touch with danger the triumph of escape gives one a delicious moment that is why many men invent dangers for themselves it is simply for the pleasure of escaping them there are boys who enjoy wrenching knockers off doors not because knockers are an interesting kind of bric-a-brac but because there is just a chance of being caught in the act by the police i once knew a youth who had a drawer filled with knockers he felt as proud of them as a young indian would have been of an equal number of the scalps of his enemies they proved that he was a brave every man would like to be a brave though every man dare not i confess i never had much ambition to wrench knockers but that may have been because i was perfectly content with the world as it is without making it any more dangerous i often think that people who put their heads into lions mouths do not realize what a dangerous place the planet is without any artificial stimulus did the daredevil barber of bristol ever realize i wonder the danger he was in every time he raised a fork with a piece of roast beef to his lips either the beef might have choked him or it might have given him ptomaine poisoning or if it failed of either of these there are at least half a dozen fatal diseases which vegetarians say are caused by eating it even if we take for granted that there is little danger in plain beef are there not curries and sausages and pork pies on which a lover of risks may exercise his daring in the restaurants i know people who are afraid to eat fish on a monday lest it may have gone bad over the weekend others live in terror of mackerel and herrings i myself have always admired the gallantry of londoners who go into a chance restaurant and order lobsters or curried prawns then there are all the tinned foods a spoil for heroes i have known a v c who was frightened of tinned salmon and a man's food is not more beset with peril than his drink even if he confines himself to water he is in danger at every sip if the water is too hard it may deposit destruction in his arteries if it is too soft it may give his child rickets or it may be populous with germs and give him typhoid fever if on the other hand he is dissatisfied with the drink of the beasts and takes to beverages the use of which distinguishes men from oxen what a nightmare procession of potential ills lies in wait for him you may read an account of them in any temperance tract the very enumeration of them would drive a weak man to water if water itself were not suspect but alas even to breathe is to put oneself in danger there are more germs in a bus than there are stars in the firmament and one cannot walk along the strand without all sorts of bacilli shooting their little arrows at one at every breath 
if men realized these things truly realized them they would see that there is no need to go to the north pole in order to live dangerously a walk from charing cross to st paul's would then be seen to be as rich in hairbreadth escapes as a voyage to an island of head-hunters the man who lives the most thrilling life i know is a man who rarely stirs beyond his garden every time he is pricked by a thorn or gets a little earth in his fingernail he rushes into the house to bathe his hands in lysol and for days afterwards he keeps feeling his jaw to see whether it is stiffening with the first signs of tetanus he lives in a condition of recurrent alarm he gets more frights in a week than an ordinary traveller could get in a year i have often advised him to give up gardening seeing that he finds it so exciting i have come to the conclusion however that he enjoys those half-hourly rushes to the lysol bottle the desperate game of hide-and-seek with lockjaw he needs no barrel to roll him over niagara in order to gaze into the bright eyes of danger he finds all the danger he wants at the root of the meanest brussels sprout that blows End of chapter nineteen